distinguished guests and honored cadets, it's a sure privilege to be here this morning. Um, I've been on the VMI campus before speaking to students, and I love to get out and speak to students and encourage, as General Cody put it, the leaders of tomorrow. Uh, I'm still at NASA um, after spending 23 years in the military, but a, a vast majority of that time at NASA. And over that period of time, as both a soldier and an astronaut, and then as a civilian leader within NASA, uh, I've learned some key fundamentals that have taken me through my career that I'd like to share with you this morning. This is the International Space Station, and it started with my third space flight, where we took up the first US module. We rendezvoused, and we made it to the first Russian module that was launched out of Baikonur Cosmodrome. And we started off on this journey to build, piece by piece, 215 miles up, the International Space Station. Along the way, we lost a spacecraft and a crew. The Space Shuttle Columbia was lost in February of 2003. We had to stand down for two and a half years and fix things, primarily the management within NASA. And that's part of what I'm going to speak to you about this morning. Because just like within NASA, within the Army, your decisions could literally mean the life and death of your soldiers. And you always need to keep that in the forefront of your mind. No speech I give would, would be complete without a, at least a short video of uh, flying in space. So I would like to show just a, a short video. We found a common ground upon which adversaries and former enemies can come together. I have long believed that a society that stops exploring is a society that stops progressing. progressing, progressing, progressing. This program is the bridge to the future for human spaceflight, human spaceflight. What happened in this last year is truly phenomenal. The space station today is the largest and most capable space station ever flown. Rocket, beginning the first expedition to the International Space Station and setting the stage for permanent human presence in space. Permanent human presence in space. Human presence in space. Trust me, it is as fun as it looks, uh, and uh, the views are even more spectacular when you're in space looking out the window. And it's, it's truly an honor and a privilege to be a part of a very small number of people that are very visible within a program that's literally tens of thousands of people across many, many countries across the world, all working together for a common goal. And again, the similarities between that and the military are, are so similar that hopefully some of the leadership tenets that I've learned in my career can apply no matter what type of unit that you're deployed to. And my first tenet is 
organizations don't achieve great success as people do. And you can see one of my favorite quotes from General Colin Powell. It's all about taking care of the troops, and if you take care of the troops, they will take care of you through their loyalty and commitment to you and to the organization. I'm sure all of you have learned some fundamental precepts, such as go to the back of the chow line, really good rule, and you can apply that throughout the rest of your career. Basically, don't ever ask anybody in your organization to do something that you wouldn't volunteer to do. And in fact, you should be first in line. Keep everybody informed, especially in times of crisis. Because if facts aren't available, rumor and innuendo will be pervasive. One of the most important things you can keep in mind, praise in public, criticize in private. Trust me, if you criticize in public, people aren't going to remember what the person did, but they're sure going to remember your message, and they're going to remember you, and probably in a negative way. Praise in public, criticize in private. You can see here in the quote, the day the soldiers stop bringing their problems to you, you have stopped leading them. That is so true. The most respected leaders, as I think back over the course of my career and those that I've tried to emulate, are those that really took care of the troops, took a personal interest in them, in their families, in their careers, and mentored them throughout their entire career. This may be <clears throat> the quote that, that best assimilates my career. And my next tenant is don't hire yes men. And I absolutely love this one. If you have a yes man working for you, one of you is redundant. Nothing could be truer. You know, questioning technical data and decisions is truly an indicator of a healthy and learning organization. You know, as you f learn in engineering or in the sciences or even anywhere in leadership, there's no such thing as a perfect fix. And one of the most uh, interesting interchanges that I saw was after the Columbia accident. We were in this return to flight time. It took us two and a half years to return the shuttle to safe flight. We questioned everything. We reviewed every hazard. And at one point, the engineers came in and wanted to make, quote, the no-brainer fix to a battery in our spacesuit. And we had had an issue with orientation in a 1G environment that the battery uh, was starting to leak in that environment. Of course, in microgravity, we didn't have that issue. But sometimes that was sitting in a 1G environment on the pad waiting to launch for weeks at a time. So as we discussed the fix, it seemed like it was going to be a pretty short meeting. And the person chairing the meeting, the deputy program manager, stopped the meeting and said, I'm not going to approve this fix until some engineer can tell me the negative aspect of this change. And we sat there and listened to the clock tick away for over five minutes. And finally, one of the contractor engineers spoke up and said, you know, there was this issue uh, with the circuit board and here's the issue, and here's how we resolved it. That created a little bit more discussion. And, and truly, there were, there were some issues. So just remember, there's no such thing as a perfect fix. Um, we have made fixes to spacecraft only to find months, even years later, the negative aspects of that change. So give things a little bit of shelf life if there's time. We also operate in a very high ops tempo when we're in the course of a mission, and especially in the course of an eight and a half minute asset. It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to orbit. So we're used to dealing in a high ops tempo environment, and if we have to make a decision, our training will kick in, we'll make that decision. But if it's not critical to make that decision in a split second, don't make it. Get as much data as you possibly can before making that decision, because again, your decisions could mean life or death of those under your charge. And also, she, one of the characteristics of leaders that, that I've always looked up to is that they can admit their own mistakes 
And I know now I'm, I'm in the classroom for a short period of time in a rotational assignment. The first thing I tell my students is if I can't answer your question, I'll go and find the answer. Never be too proud to admit you don't have all the answers because this is a very complex and highly technological world that we're in and very few people anymore have every single answer at their fingertips. Consult the experts. Don't be afraid to admit your shortcomings and, and trust those uh, who are cutting edge, who have the latest in technology to advise you. This is one that, again, applies in the military or in civilian life. Don't ever let a professional disagreement go to a personal level. I kind of like this quote from Margaret Thatcher. It's pretty, pretty to the point. And, you know, while confidence is highly encouraged, arrogance is completely unacceptable. And if you're dealing uh, with, a, with a critical decision, encourage peer reviews by outside experts. The organization that I'm now with, the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, was stood up after the Columbia accident. It was stood up because of the Columbia accident. And we are there to be called in for very tough engineering problems. We helped with the Chilean minor rescue. I certainly hope, helped with the Columbia safe return to flight. Uh, we helped with the Toyota unintended acceleration of their vehicles. So we never know what problem we're gonna be called in. And there came a time when we did our own unique work as applied to the next generation spacecraft. And I went to my boss and said, you know, we really need a peer review of our work because here we are, the independent engineering organization, and we're doing our own independent work, and I want somebody to come in and do a critical review of our work. And again, whenever you can bring in outside experts to look at your organization, to look at how you're performing, whether it's from a technology perspective, whether it's from a management perspective, that's one of the greatest things and one of the greatest gifts you can give your organization. Because once you're embedded, you know, it's really hard to step back. You've probably all seen the exercise where people stand right in front of a screen. And that's all you see. And it's when you step back do you see the whole global environment. And so I'd encourage you to always think about bringing in outside expertise and helping you in your decisions. Not only should you be a technical expert, but obviously you should be a tactical expert as well. And that in and of itself will cause those to seek you out as a leader. Always be the best you can possibly be from a technical and tactical perspective. And that will create an environment in which everybody strives to be better. Because I know that Along the course of my career, I, I would fly with a lot of senior warrant officers, and a lot of them had combat time. And on a bad weather day, we'd sit around and, and play 100 questions. And when a young lieutenant or young captain can kind of go head to head with a CW4 on a technical question, all of a sudden, they, they, they start hitting the books as well. And they come back, and they seek you out as a leader. So that's one of the best things you can do. You want to encourage and promote professional development. If you wait for a good time to send people off for professional development, or for yourself, more importantly, that time will never come. You have to make that time, because it will make you a better soldier, it will make you a better follower, and it will make you a better leader. So always make time for professional development. Alternate opinions is a terminology that came about after Columbia. The Columbia Accident Investigation Board, which was an outside commission, determined that the Columbia accident, the loss of the vehicle and the crew, was as much a failure of management and of our organizational culture as it was due to any technical problem. And that's striking. If you're in an organization whose entire culture, and the culture dates back to the late 50s, the very beginnings of our space exploration within this nation. 
And that entire culture, that entire organization is faulted as leading to the loss of seven lives. It's really time for some introspection, not only of yourself as a leader, but also the organization. You can see here that Columbia Accident Investigation Board actually called out managers and called out the way in which they led meetings, the way in which they made decisions for creating barriers against dissenting or alternate opinions. There were many individuals, though lower in the organization, that knew right away there was a problem with Columbia. And they tried very hard to get additional imagery. They had the analysis that showed that if what they suspected, though not confirmed, could have caused catastrophic damage to the vehicle, which would not be catastrophic on orbit, but would as soon as they started into entry and started to experience the temperatures that exceed 2,400 degrees Fahrenheit. That is exactly what happened in the loss of Columbia. Had it gone for three more seconds, they would have been out of the peak heating range, and we might have had a safe spacecraft. That spacecraft was so incredibly robust that despite a 13-inch gapping hole in the wing and burn through of a lot of the wiring and excessive temperatures on the structural components, it held together until the last three seconds of the peak heating range. And at that point, as you probably know, there was a catastrophic breakup and loss of the seven crew members. And it all goes back to, was the data there? Yes, it was. Was the hazard identified? Yes, it was. There's something <clears throat> that Charles Perot from Yale University calls the normalization of deviance. And what that means is, once an off-nominal situation occurs, if it occurs enough times, people start to normalize it. Yeah, we've seen that before. That's what normally happens. And it's just right waiting for that right set of circumstances to have a catastrophic effect. And so listen to those who have alternate opinions. Encourage those who have alternate opinions. I was tapped to be the leader of the Space Shuttle Safety Mission Assurance Organization after the Columbia accident. Trust me, that was not a job I sought out. I got a call, and I got a call up to my former commander's office, who was then in charge of the flight crew operations director, and said, we really need you to step up and do this. And as you might imagine, that was a very bleak situation at that point. Right after the accident, pretty much every single manager within the shuttle program was fired, and all new management was put in place. And there was a lot of attention on safety and mission assurance, a lot of importance placed on safety and mission assurance, as it should have been. And what you'll find is that there's particularly junior soldiers or people in the organization, and they feel like, well, I can't raise my hand and speak up. I can't raise my hand and speak up because of this person's rank or this person's stature, or maybe I'm uncertain about what I really know. And at that point, you need to have a relationship where you can encourage them that they can come to you and you can be their spokes spokesman. And when you speak up, no one in that room should be able to tell that that's not your own personal opinion, that you're representing another individual, but you're representing that alternate opinion and you're representing it as if it were your own. I learned this lesson as a second lieutenant. It may sound uh, a little funny, but um, we actually had two secretaries in a unit that I was in, and one was phenomenal. And one worked from 7 a.m. to 6.30 or 7 p.m., and this was prior to the internet, so the other one read magazines. And every piece of paper ended up on the one's desk, and nothing went to the other one. And I once sat down and, and talked to her and said, you know, how come you haven't progressed? You've been here for 18 years. Obviously, you're highly skilled. Everybody in the organization seeks you out. And it was because no one wanted to lose them from the organization. So they kept them in a position that was lower than what they very well deservedly should have been in because everybody valued them in that current position. You, you can't ever do that to somebody. When you see someone 
who has the capability, who has the skills to succeed. It is your job as a leader to mentor them, to make those opportunities possible, to provide for additional education, to provide for additional opportunities, and to help them succeed. Never stifle someone's career or trap them in an organization, especially because they're an asset to that organization. And you can see from the quote, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, that's what makes you a leader. You hear a lot about authority and responsibility and accountability. And you need to be very, very clear that accountability can never be relinquished. As I said in Columbia, starting with the program manager, pretty much every single manager in the space shuttle program was relieved of duty following the accident. Again, because it was a failure of management that was cited and a failure of the management culture. And especially in the military, you can delegate responsibility. You can delegate authority and grant that authority to others but you can never relinquish your accountability. Again, one of my favorite quotes from, from General Powell. And just a reminder that accountability can never be escaped. It arises from responsibility. So when you look around and you, you're going to be uh, assigning and delegating tasks and duties and responsibilities, keep in mind that ultimately the accountability for not only their actions, but your actions solely rests with you. Maybe this isn't a problem in the military, but this is sure a problem in civilian government. Um, sometimes any decision is better than indecisiveness. As I said, we work in a high ops tempo at times, and we're very well trained, very well scripted. And if something should occur during that eight and a half minute ascent, we can very instinctively make the right corrective action. However, making decisions in our normal daily course of business can sometimes be a very grueling process. And let me give you the military example. And I've used, that at I've used this at NASA and everybody goes, good analogy. So you're on your field exercise or you're out in combat and you're following a leader that's simply, literally, going in circles. At that point, it's better to charge the wrong hill, because at least when you get to the top, you know you're in the wrong place. If you're still going in circles in the woods, you're going nowhere. So there comes a time where you need to make a decision, you need to move out. If it's the wrong decision, at least when you get there, you're going to realize it was the wrong one. It does no one any good to just go on endlessly without making a decision. It destroys morale within the organization, and it affects you as a leader and the way people look at you as a leader. And you can see Lee Iacocca, the chairman of the board, the one word that makes a good manager, decisiveness. And that, that's very, very true. There are times, you know, some people have an 80% role. Given 80% of the data, I can make a decision. My threshold of data is a little bit higher, probably because I have a PhD, and if I have adequate time, I'll gather a little bit more data. But if there's not adequate time, you need to make a decision and move out and have full confidence in your decision so that those under your charge can look to you as a leader, can have confidence, and follow through with the mission. Be flexible and adaptable. And, you know, the road that you see ahead of you today may actually conceal another path that you may follow tomorrow. My career has taken many turns and twists that I would have never thought. If you asked me when I was in your shoes as a cadet, I would have said, I'm going to go in the military, I'm going to be in Medical Service Corps, fly medevacs, I'm going to go to medical school. And that was my goal and that was my dream. Until in flight school, we tragically lost my two stick buddies and my instructor pilot. And it was a, a mere fluke that I wasn't on the aircraft that day. Literally at the last minute, about five minutes before we walked out to the aircraft, another instructor pilot walked up to us and said, one of my students is sick today, let me fly one of your students. 
And the captain looked around and said, Lieutenant, you go ahead and go with this other crew. I was an eyewitness to that accident. There were four souls on board. My first thought was, well, that's not my crew, because there would only be three of us. And little did I know that because I was not in the back, that the captain, who was a company commander, had chosen to hop in the back of the aircraft and give a no-notice evaluation ride. And he was also killed. And it was at that point I decided to alter my course. And I went and got a master's degree in safety engineering. And then I went and got a doctorate in industrial engineering with an emphasis in ergonomics and human factors engineering, solely because that accident was a human failure. Instead of moving the hydraulic switch, they took the emergency governor switch to emergency, oversped the engine, while at the same time having hydraulic hardover. And the aircraft went rapidly out of control and crashed inverted. Also in the Columbia accident, as I said, I would have never thought I would have found myself in a management position. I was pretty happy as an astronaut, um, very happy as an astronaut, and I would have been very content to do that for many, many more years. But because of the Columbia accident and because of the importance to return our nation to safely flying in space, my career took another turn when I was tapped on the shoulder and asked to lead the safety and mission assurance office. So you never know, and you have to allow for that flexibility and adaptability. You just, you may think you have a path charted, but you never know where your career might take you. And just be thankful for all the opportunities that you have. You know, a lot of young people ask me, you know, well, what's the course I can follow? And they want this, they want this very step approach to becoming an astronaut. And what I've told them is, no matter what you do, have a love for what you do, have a passion for what you do, because you'll do well at it. And you'll succeed if you have a passion for doing what you love to do. And so I would have never become an Army aviator if I didn't think there was a very good chance my career was going to be spent as an Army aviator. And I would have been perfectly happy and content, and I would have had a tremendous career. And so whatever your final goal is, if you approach it as a ladder, and you never know where on that ladder, what rung you're going to stop on. But you're going to be content no matter where on, along that path that you stop. That's going to lead you to not only a successful career, but one that's truly enriching and rewarding. And this is extremely important. You know, f fame is, is very temporary, and family and friends are forever. My late husband used to have a saying, and it was the what have you done for me lately syndrome. And uh, one of the funniest stories I've ever heard was from Captain John Young. And Captain Young had flown on uh, Gemini, Apollo, and he flew and commanded the first space shuttle mission. And he said when he was a fir first an astronaut, he would go out and speak to the public, and they would say, wow, you're an astronaut? That's, that's really cool. Have you flown in space? And he said, well, no. And they'd say, yeah, forget it. So then he finally had his first space flight, and he was feeling pretty good about it. And he'd go and show his crew movies, and people would meet him, and they'd say, are you an astronaut? He'd say, well, yes, I am. Have you flown in space? Why, well, yes, I have. And they said, well, how many times? He said, once. And they said, ah. So finally, uh, he flew in Apollo. He drove the lunar ro rover on the surface of the moon. And he was feeling really good about himself and went out, spoke to the public, and they said, so you're an astronaut, right? And he said, why, yes, I am. Have you flown in space? Well, yes, I have. Have you been to the moon? Yes, I have. How many times? Once. Ah, forget it. <laughs> so, you know, if you're out to please um, anyone other than yourself and your friends, um, it's going to be something that you're going to continually chase. And, and, and trust me, there's no reward in that. Um, you know, your family is extremely important. Whatever career you choose, your family is choosing it along with you. Having a career like an astronaut and having a, a fairly significant risk, you know, over the course of time, we've lost 13 astronauts. So the loss rate, 13 out of approximately 300, is fairly high. 
And you go in knowing that. Well, I went in on my first flight, and I was a single parent. So the approach that I chose is I wrote a letter to my daughter, and I described why I took the risk that I did and why I felt strongly about this country's goal of exploring space. And I handed that sealed letter to my friends, and I said, if I come back safely, give me the letter back. All four times I wrote a letter, and all four times I got that letter back. But it's extremely important. So involve your family. They're a big part of this. And when you have the opportunity, as I have, to truly have a global perspective on the world, you know, one of the most striking things and one of the most humbling things, spaceflight is a very humbling experience. As you're circling the Earth 17,500 miles an hour, 215 miles up, when we went and serviced the Hubble Space Telescope, we were 350 miles up. And as you look back to the Earth, what you see as you fly over Houston, Texas, is this small dot. And you know within that small dot, it encapsulates your entire life, your family, your church, your friends. And you, know, you realize that your place in the world is, is really a microscopic part of this vast universe. And it's a very humbling experience. But it also brings to light the importance that those family and friends have in your life. Um, one of the most incredible things I had the opportunity to do is after my last space flight, President Bush invited us up to the White House. And he spent an hour with us in the Oval Office. An extremely friendly, down-to-earth individual. It was just an incredible experience. And he described the whole history of the Oval Office, described everything about it. And he had two pictures on the wall. And the first was, it symbolized um, a Methodist hymn. And he said, I have this on my wall as a constant reminder that there is a greater being out there that I serve. And the second thing he had was a picture of his ranch in Crawford, Texas. And he said, do you know why I keep this here? Because that's where I came from, and that's where I'm going back to. And so he was always cognizant that he was just there for a temporary period, that he had been entrusted with this incredible opportunity and incredible power, but it was very, very temporary. And the things that he held most dear in his life, his family, his friends, his faith, were those that would sustain him for the rest of his life. And so I think that, although I knew that going in, some of the lessons that I learned, even from the President of the United States, have really stuck with me for the remainder of my career. So uh, General Cody and I were saying, you know, as we, as we look out upon the cadets, it reminds us of how old we are and how young you are and how we wish we could go back and do it all over again. I don't think I'd change anything about my career. It's been an incredible experience, um, but I'd like to have the opportunity to do it all over again. So as I look at you and the opportunities that you face, um, I'm filled with awe and wonderment about what's your career going to look like? What are the great things that you're gonna do? Because you wouldn't be selected to be here this morning unless you had those incredible capabilities because they're already being recognized. So take that to heart that someone recognizes your leadership capabilities, your intelligence, your technical expertise, your tactical expertise, and take that to heart and do the best you can, not only for yourselves, but for those under your charge. I hope you have an incredible experience over the next few days, learn a lot, if you have some amazing speakers and mentors coming in, and you should feel truly blessed to have this opportunity at such an uh, early point in your career. So thank you very, very much for allowing me to spend some time with you this morning, and uh, God bless and Godspeed in your careers.